part two of our Theodore White uh, lecture program for 2014, and this is really one of the more interesting parts of it always, because we use the comments of the night before and the themes raised the night before as a point of departure with our uh, speakers and also with some invited guests and participants, and also we will get to you. We're going to have a conversation here for a bit, then we will open it up to a general conversation. And we start with last night, but we certainly don't end there. So the, the, uh, the themes of last night are not limiting, they're just the beginning. Uh, let me, I think uh, you know everyone on the panel, there are two people I'd like to introduce just very briefly. Um, Kristen Anderson is, the, uh, is an IOP fellow. She is the uh, founder of Echelon Insights. Uh, I'm going to ask her to explain what Echelon Insights does, but it's really very germane and interesting. That's one of the reasons we wanted her to be on this panel, uh, because it's both media and politics in a very kind of uh, uh, digital, modern way. Uh, go ahead, Kristen. Uh, certainly. Uh, so Echelon Insights is a opinion research, data analytics, and sort of digital intelligence firm. We're trying to come up with new ways to study public opinion, um, where voters are at, uh, and how to track uh, what they're hearing, what they're finding persuasive. Uh, we've got things such as um, Insights on Air, which is a big database of all of the ad buys that campaigns are making. Uh, and these are just some of the products in the first couple of months of Echelon that we've started to roll out. You're just a couple of months old? Uh, we launched right before I came up here for the, the fellowship. Well, you've got a lot of confidence <laughs> in your staff. Uh, and to my left, to your right, uh, is Jill Abramson, uh, the uh, immediate past executive editor of the New York Times and my colleague there for, uh, for years and uh, now a member of the faculty of Harvard University. Welcome. Um, there were two fundamental themes last night, it seems to me. One was the future of journalism and the other is the future of politics. And I'd like to begin, I'd like to treat them separately uh, if we can. Uh, and I'd like to start by asking you, David Rogers, how you responded to what John Heilman said last night about the future of journalism, his optimism rooted in a, you know, without question, a very active uh, digital uh, uh, innovative uh, arena that is growing uh, but at the cost of something else. But how do you see it? If you would speak into the mic so, so uh, everyone can hear. All right. I take it a little bit closer. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I think my experience probably is most relevant here is Politico. Um, I came there really just a year after it started. So I've been there seven of the eight years of Politico. And I think what I, my reaction a little bit was, you have to remember, we, we started ourselves really as a paper that would then be on the internet and now we're, we're, we're sort of, it, it's a, the way it's all changing, it's a little like Alice's Red Queen where you're sort of racing to stay ahead. And I think there is um, potential there. I would be cautioned you know, in our experience, we started with a paper and we basically could survive as a paper because we were selling advocacy journal advocacy ads. And that was that's a particular situation in Washington that doesn't exist necessarily around the country. And so then we, we morphed more into the internet. I know from talking to Van de Heij, he is constantly amazed. He's really become a businessman from being a journalist. and. He's constantly amazed at how we all chase mirages. And you know, the more first mirages, we'll get this many contacts and we'll be able to sell this, and then we'll do this and we'll do that. And he has, he's saying, when I say we, I mean the industry. I think that some of the optimism is sometimes exaggerated because of the fact that people, you can make contact with people, but you're not necessarily then generating revenue for your base. And he's had to deal with that. I think. Um, I do think one of the things that came up that was the example of the Austin uh, ProPublica. There are a lot of empty state house press galleries around the country, and I know Politico was interested in, in expanding in that area, and I think that potentially is a big area. I think when I think of expansion, I don't necessarily think of Washington as much as I think state capitals around the country. That I think that you can set up. You know, we're doing that in New York. Some, but you. you I think you've got potential around the country of having more 
internet, uh, you know, news. Um, you do need some overarching vehicle. You know, it's not like you can just move into some some town and set up a thing. So, like Madison, you'd have to have some vehicle which you could sort of communicate to people <coughs> with. I think that um, I do wince a little bit about the branding. Um, there was someone at the conference <coughs> announced he was he had a brand. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I was like, oh, what, are you, "What are you talking about? You're a reporter. What do you mean you have a brand?" But the, you know, that's that's part of what it's changing. You know, and, I, and to that extent, I'm well, I think if anyone in political reportage has a brand, it's you. I mean, the sense that, that no, people you know, people you know I mean? you people don't, you don't you, you try to have, you try to do your job best, but I mean, I think I worry when journalists talk about a brand. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't. You know, we're not. We're, we're, you know, you, you do the best you can, but you don't brand yourself. And I think that that, um, I guess one last thing I would say too is I'm, I'm a great fan of the New York Times and everything it does, but in, I think sometimes when people look at internet journalism, they say, well, it's not the New York Times. You know, they sort of miss something in their life. <laughs> well, there are things that the Times doesn't do, okay? And, Times did not cover the farm bill. All right, and, and uh, let me just use the farm bill as an example of journalism. The farm bill is sort of central to America and central to Congress, but the fact is the regional press has collapsed. Okay, so the regional press that used to cover the farm bill doesn't exist anymore. The national papers are more coastal and don't cover the farm bill anymore. The uh, irony of the, and what people who cover the farm bill are paid newsletters. That's what's really happened. With Politico, we have the same thing. We now depend a part of our income on Politico Pro. We're essentially selling you know, news almost like Bloomberg sells to what it does. But the point is, the irony of the situation, I always thought, I mean, some of the best ag reporters don't write for the farmer anymore. They write for newsletters that go to the lobbies. And the irony of the last farm bill, I think, was that probably the most accessible news for a farmer in America was political. And I don't say that bragging, but the reality was if you were a farmer out in South Dakota or Nebraska, you couldn't get news on the farm bill without something like that. Do you see any, any other David Rogers types out there doing this for the general public? What do you mean? I don't understand. Well, doing, I mean, who was competing with you on coverage of the farm bill? Well, the people who were competing with me. Well, I mean, were the newsletter. I'm yeah, talking about for yeah. the general, for the general. There was. There were a lot of people, there were a lot of people who write about a topic like the farm bill who write behind paywalls. Mm -hmm. You know, and the average farmer won't see that. I mean, I ran into this. I would call someone and they said, oh, we know who you are. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to claim I was speaking the farm sector, but the point is, they, if, when they get up in the morning and check their futures contracts, they might go to Politico. And Jill, you were the one who had to decide the triage of what resources to use for what. How does the, a newspaper like the New York Times now address these kinds of problems, like the Farm Bill? Well, I mean, frankly, I don't, I, I don't think a lot of sleep is being lost. Uh, I'm not there anymore, but I predict in, at the New York Times over coverage of the Farm Bill. I mean, I, I see the trend in political reporting, unfortunately, away from the very detailed, substantive kind of reporting that David Rogers does to basically, and I don't mean to insult our lectures of last night, but the prevailing style now is to cover campaigns and politics like a sporting event. Um, it's a battle, constant conflict, juicy behind the scenes, the uh, colorful scooplets, which are, I am, you know, the first to admit, delicious, and I read them every morning, but. Uh, Substantive coverage of legislation in Congress isn't the kind of sexy reading that that is. I, I, I'm not 
embracing that view, but I think that's the prevailing reality. John Heilman, do you say, would you say that Jill has that pretty much right or not? Uh, certainly it's been the case that um, there's been too little coverage of uh, policy in recent years, but I actually think the trend now is more in the direction of, as there is a, a proliferation of different kind of outlets doing different kinds of things, there are more and more um, places that are finding a benefit in going and you know, trying to find a, a niche at doing exactly that kind of thing. I mean, I, I, there's no doubt if you've looked up the, the, the trend in the last 20 years that we would all agree that there's been too little uh, substantive coverage of the details of pretty much everything, whether it's legislation or regulatory policy or whatever. And there have been, you know, there have been, you know, kind of, there's been a constant complaint of people in the business. Uh, at the same time, I do think more recently you're starting to see uh, people who are finding a niche in doing that kind of thing, and whether it's doing <coughs> policy explainers or or digging kind of deeply into. And you know, David's always made a, made a career out of this, so we've always had David. And we've always had. There are others who are. He's not alone doing that kind of work, and he's always been able to find an outlet, and prominent outlets for his work, and there have been others that have found a, a niche for that too, and people prize those people and always have, and I think will increasingly do that uh, as younger people step into that. You know, there is a now niche of you know, detailed policy reportage that's coming into play. Well, that's interesting. Mark, you said last night that you read everything that David writes, as I recall, or most everything he writes anyway. Uh, do you see a lot of people out there doing, young people doing the kind of thing that David Rogers sort of made his hallmark? Um, almost none, and no, none at the level that David does it. You know, when David just said what he said just now about individual brands, I felt guilty for what I said last night, uh, partly guilty, but also um, <laughs> tempted to create, I don't know if it would be news, but controversy by disagreeing. You know, David's right, I'm sure, that farmers read his stuff now, uh, but David should be significantly more famous than he is. Uh, and I think it would serve Politico well, and my perception of what would serve David well, which is different than what David's perception is, uh, if more people knew who he was, which in the current age involves being on television and radio and having his picture appear with his work in a way that, that he's chosen not to do. And I respect him for it entirely. The thing about David is, uh, if you read his policy articles uh, about, say, appropriations or the Farm Bill, um, he, he has uh, uh, a, a, a complete handle on the personalities he's writing about. And one of the things that has impressed me throughout his career uh, at the Journal and, and, and before is he'll write a paragraph about a committee chair, a very compact paragraph that will tell you exactly what you need to know about how personality is part of the legislative process. I don't know anybody I've read in my career, maybe a couple of people, Johnny Apple is pretty good at it too, who captures the personality, the intersection between the personality and the policy in a way that David does. My biggest complaint or, or concern now, uh, and it's true at the New York Times for sure, is you've got a bunch of younger people. Everybody has to do their first stint on the Hill and their first time in a campaign. But I think the preponderance of people at the Times, and, and a lot of people at Politico now besides David, are, are inexperienced and not getting the kind of grounding that is required to eventually be like David. David, why do you not want to be on television, have your picture with your work, and, and be better you, And known. if you decide you do and you want a manager, you're <laughs> totally available for a very reasonable percentage. No, I'm not good at that. You know, I'm microphone? Sorry. Yeah, microphone. Well, there isn't much more to say than that. I mean, you know, when I went to the Wall Street Journal, there was a period where Hunt tried to get me to do Washington Week some. I would end up saying Mr. Duke instead of Paul, and so uh, that, didn't, that didn't last very long. See, see, if I were your manager, I'd turn that into a thing. Right. Well, no, look, I mean, I, I, I'm not, you know, I know what I'm good at and what I'm not good at, and, or I think I know it. So I, I think, I do think there are, I think what John said about people can develop in niches now, you know, and that there's a market there, and there's a, for people to develop. I think the challenge, is, there's two challenges. I mean, basically, journalism, you can't forget you're in somewhat the entertainment business. You want people to read, okay? You want you, you can't just write, you don't write a policy paper, you have to write a story that with some personality that people will read. And then I think the second thing is the financial situation now is where some of the better policy people 
are writing behind paywalls. Okay, so you're not really communicating to the larger American public. You may be creating a very useful newsletter that somehow has some subscribers who, you know, in our situation, I think the political problems tend to go out early to a certain environment and then some of it will be posted on the website. Okay, so, I, but you know, in fact, I worry a little bit in our situation about if we become where we leave all the policy to political pro and then we just do politics. You know, we, we really have to mesh those two. The challenge is to mesh the policy and the politics and do it with enough personality that people want to read it. And I think that will always be the challenge. And I think you, and then you have to make it pay. And to well, well, I'll just, just, just to say, just, uh, just to throw, throw in two things in this conversation. I mean, I think, you know, we have a, you know, the, an example that comes to mind, for instance, of someone who has, um, who has gotten quite a lot of success and, and celebrity on some level, and now has received a lot of investment uh, for what he's doing is Ezra Klein, who I think made his reputation for a lot of people. And again, there's things that Ezra writes about and talks about that he has a lot less expertise on than what I'm about to say, but when he covered the healthcare law, I think people, his reputation was basically built on the notion of detailed policy reportage. And he managed to turn himself into a brand on that basis, and now has a company that is, that is receiving a lot of investment um, from a lot of smart investors who think that there's a pop-up. David Lanhart is it's an another exam. one. Yes, and I'm not trying. I'm not trying to say there are others. I'm just giving one example of someone who took policy nerdery and then turned that into a television persona, and um, and now is, is running a, a, a an operation that may or may not succeed. As I said last night, could fail, could succeed. Who knows? You know, we at Bloomberg. Um, part of Bloomberg Law, you know, sponsors a thing called SCOTUS Blog, which is which a lot of people know here. Lyle Denniston writes for that, and a bunch of law professors that have covered. I said, would think would say probably have done the best, most detailed coverage of Supreme Court jurisprudence over the course of the last four or five years. That are not behind the paywall. It's true that they are part of the Bloomberg network, but they also get pushed out through the web through Bloomberg.com. So, again, I, you know, one can, you know, so there's a there's a, there are big trends, and then there are examples of counter trends and. To me, it seems like there are these are examples of things where there is a, a large and hungry market, or at least a substantial hungry market for that kind of detailed stuff, and it's increasingly starting to get filled. John, would you agree? I think an interesting experiment going on in real time now is what Chuck Todd is trying to do with the Meet the Press program, which is in a way a roll the dice. Um, and try nerddom. He even has added a segment on data reporting, which goes into some detail about polling and trends that I noticed is called, of all things, nerd screen when it comes on. But, I mean, he, he I think, is trying to tiptoe towards or run towards making that program more substance-based. And it will be interesting to see if the ratings reward him or not, because obviously NBC at a certain point is going to want to see the dollars roll in. Kristen, I want to get you into this conversation. What do you see in this kind of data area, and, uh, and how does this affect how you would approach doing what you do? So I think the rise of quote unquote data journalism is fascinating because it, it, it's requiring, I think, and I'd be interested to hear what the other panelists think about this, traditional journalists to have more comfort with data, with polling, with uh, statistics uh, when they do their reporting. Um, and it's giving people, uh, I, I think you particularly see you know, the rise of things like charts and graphs uh, on sites like you know, 538, a uh, site like Vox, because it's very easy, an easy way to share something that makes someone's point. Uh, one of the things, sort of a reaction to last night in terms of the optimism about where journalism is headed, uh, I have a bit of pessimism in that something that I'm deeply concerned about is the kind of fragmentation of, of journalism, where you now have folks who are looking for news that sort of goes along with their worldview. If I'm center left, I can go to Vox and I can have data that proves to me that I'm right. And if I'm center right, I can go to something like the Daily Signal and I can get data that proves that I'm right. Um, and so what's been fascinating is you have data journalism, which is supposed to be very rooted in fact. And you have many sites, even ones that do have some of an ideological lean that, that are very good at it. 
But even nowadays, because of the internet and the plethora of sites people can go to, you can find your own facts that back up your own world. Mark, how do you respond to that? Does that comport with what your sense of the world is out there that is consuming, you know, journalism? Well, there's a lot of it that um, is phony because it's statistics for statistics' sake. Um, the, the most obvious example from the midterms is the sites that purported to have statistical models telling you the percentage chance someone had to win a particular race. Um, and this notion that you know, if someone had a 78% chance of winning and then the next day it was 75%. And you saw candidates who were given chances of winning above 90% who lost. And it's, it's mostly garbage in and garbage out because they're, they're basing their models on things that don't actually comport to the real world. So I'm very interested in, in things that, and I think it's great that now we have the tools to do them and, and not just to crunch the numbers, but as was said, to display them in a, in a Way that's visually appealing. Very interested in things like looking at, at campaigns fundraising, campaign spending, um, demographics. Um, I think it's fascinating to look, for instance, at you know the states the Democrats have won um, five or six cycles in a row that add up to 242 electoral votes. I think it's fascinating to look at the margins each of those times and to see the chances Republicans have of winning a state that they've lost and overcoming a seven-point margin, say, from the last cycle. I think there's lots of ways in politics and in government do that, but I think the things that have gotten the most attention and the things that have um, that have sort of popularized this notion of government and politics coverage uh, being data driven are junk and have kind of given the thing a bad name and crowd out better better projects. Well, the, the that started, I mean, if there was a uh, sexy moment when d data became sexy, it was Nate Silver uh, at the New York Times handicapping the presidential election of 2012. Do you see that as junk in, junk out? Or, I mean, is, how do you look at something like that, which turned out to be pretty prescient? I mean, the Republicans certainly did not accept his analysis, but was it just, did he happen to get it right because he was lucky? Or is there something there that, that there is embedded in the data that is going to be something that is both predictive and something that can be manipulated? It's averaging public polls. Well, he was certainly good at turning himself into a brand. I'll he, say that. He was, because <laughs> there was a hunger. There was a hunger for that, particularly on the left. But averaging public polls is not is not well, some and now he's, he's, trick. he's not the only person doing this. Now it seems like every site out there has to have its own model, and there's even a site now that does. It's an average of the models. Uh, where it's, <laughs> it's, it's we've, we've really gone down the rabbit hole. You here. see what uh, you did. <laughs> Um, but it, it, he's, he's right that it's garbage in, garbage out, and I think that's one of the, the troubles is that people, they view data as having all of the certainty, and actually, if you're somebody who really understands data, you understand that what data does is it allows you to quantify uncertainty, uh, that you should be humble in the face of what data can tell you instead of overly confident, and I think... Well, that's uh, a, that, would, you, would you develop that thought? That's very interesting. You should be humble in the face of data. Tell so, me. so Let's take polling, for instance, which is the, the field where I work. Uh, you, know, you can look at a poll, and a pollster will tell you, you know, we know with a 3.1% margin of error that you are up by five in this race. Well, that's not really telling the whole story because that's based on, you know, let's say it was a telephone poll. How many of you have a landline telephone that you answer regularly? Uh, and so you know, the, the way that a lot of polling is done uh, is in, in badly, badly needs uh, sort of rethought. Uh, there needs to be innovation in this space. Right now, there's no such thing as a perfect poll. There's no perfect way to get a random sample of voters. There are things you can do to get pretty close and to work with the data after the fact, but you're loading in personal assumptions at that point. And so looking at, at what data can tell you and realizing that it, while it's not perfect, it's, it can be some of the best information you can have, but uh, you know, understanding that just because you got a poll in or two polls in that shows someone up by five, if the assumptions within that poll are wrong, it's, it's almost like having no data. Really, you know, instead of looking at data as the gospel and looking at it as a guidepost and understanding the biases and assumptions that are, are baked into it, 
is incredibly important. Well, there are a couple of people I'd like to get to comment on this uh, in, uh, while we're in the, on this subject because it's they've got too much knowledge not to. Nick, I would like, this is Nick Sinai. Nick is the uh, Walter Shorenstein Fellow at the Shorenstein Center, just began yesterday, and the day before yesterday he was at the White House uh, as one of the senior people in, uh, in technology there. Uh, and data is the subject and the theme of his uh, time at, uh, at the Kennedy School at the Shorenstein Center. When you hear humble in the face of data, what do you think? And Matt, Matt Hyman is uh, also a, a Shorenstein Fellow this semester. So I, I think this is a very interesting discussion, and I, I think that, uh, that Kristen is exactly right in terms of the importance of quantifying our uncertainty. But I couldn't disagree more with you, Mark, about the value of this kind of data-driven journalism. I think it ties in very much the substance of what you were arguing for last night. Um, certainly by the end of the cycle, all you're doing essentially is averaging that's not the value of something like what Nick Silver is doing, like they're doing at Post or Monkey Cage or half a dozen other places. The value is figuring out the state of the race a year or more before election day. And you can see very clearly that these that they, these models work pretty well, even really far out, um, and that they do a pretty good job of capturing um, that capturing uh, exactly what the state of the race is. Now you complain about somebody who had a 90% chance of uh, winning the race, uh, who lost, right, narrowly. But the whole point of these models is that somebody who has a 90% chance to win should also lose 10% of the time. And these models are actually pretty well calibrated. They do a pretty good job um, of, 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 getting a, of getting right at that. I'm not, I'm not sure what you're saying we disagree with that, but I would rather have the space, the bandwidth that citizens have to think about our politics and our government taken up with thinking about the personalities of the candidates, the policies they're proposing, will they improve the real lives of real people over a year out trying to decide if Kay Hagan has a 76% chance of winning or a 74% chance of winning. But I think my argument would be that this constant horse race all is all of, is really what's crowding out the policy <coughs> Yeah, and what drives the horse race in our media today more than anything else are these bogus models that a year out people are fascinated by to say, K. Hagen have a 76% chance or a 74% chance. That's the, that's the absolute just horse race. That's creating a model to say, what's the horse race situation? That's where the horse race comes from now. Ironically, the people who do these things criticize horse race coverage. But I don't, again, I don't see what the point is a year out to know whether what percentage chance some made up model projects of K. Hagen winning or not. I just don't see the point of it. I think there's there's a tension in data journalism where somebody who is a political scientist knows that when the model moves from 76% to 74% that that's not really a big deal. But there's also uh, an appetite for panic. Oh my gosh, the model changed by 2%. That I think the incentives are to make things seem like a bigger deal than maybe uh, a sort of a, a statistical awareness of what's happening would, would recommend. I think that's a big tension in data journalism is that things that statistically are not a big deal can become really big and interesting and clickable headlines. And, and how do you balance that tension? You're saying tension is a great euphemism. What it is is just made up. And serious mm -hmm. organizations now will write big stories, mostly on blogs, that say, 
Kay Hagen's gone from 76 to 74. Let's look at why that is. Not when not. obviously it's statistically <laughs> well, meaningless, well, even if the model weren't bogus. And let's and just think about, I mean, I, to me one of the most fascinating things about this midterm in the realm of data, and I, just to go back to one point from the outset, you know, we started talking about, um, about, I mean, I think the most, to, to me the biggest story of all of this is, and, and Jill knows this really well, you know, because of what the, there was a 538, I don't remember exactly what the number was, but the traffic to New York Times. Huge. Com, I mean, it was vast, right? So whatever you think of 538, and I, share, and I share some of Mark's skepticism about, about, about it. There was a lot of demand out there for not for whatever you want to say. It's, not, it's horse race journalism in its purest form in some sense, as Mark just said, because it's just horse race numbers. But it's also not morsels or scooplets or personalities or controversy. It's data. People want data, right? So there's a big market out there for data. What we do with that market, how it gets addressed, is an interesting question going forward. And one of the interesting kind of, kind of the thing that I found so interesting about this midterm election was now that there's so much so much attention being paid to this data, we're now seeing the corruption of pollsters who are, um, and this has been written about by 538 among others, as pollsters want to be closer to the average than, and, and, and they, are, they don't want to be wrong, so they will not publish outliers. And the most striking example of this, and this goes again to Mark's thing about garbage in, garbage out, the Iowa Senate race this year, where on the eve of the Iowa Senate race, 12 of the final 13 surveys on the eve of the Iowa Senate race, had the race between a one-point lead for Bruce, Bruce Braley and a four-point lead for Joni Ernst. There was only one poll that had, it was an outlying poll, happened to be the pollster for the Art Bloomberg Politics Des Moines Register poll, uh, Ann Seltzer, who said that Joni Ernst would win by seven points and took an incredible amount of abuse for her outlier. And then, in the end, Joni Ernst won by 8.5 percentage points, and Ann Seltzer was the only one close. And the point I want to make about that, other than the fact that Ann Seltzer is great, was that she resisted the pressure to compromise her model, but many others apparently did not. John and, and, and looked at this and said, I am more afraid of being wildly wrong than being slightly wrong. So I will do whatever it is that, that it was done to their models to get them closer to the mean. And that is the ultimate case of garbage in the average out. And it's a weird thing because as there's now more scrutiny of polls, rather than getting better polls, it looks like we're getting worse polls. Well, talk, talk about the pressure that is brought to bear in a situation like that. Is this from other pollsters who are ridiculing her numbers because they conflict with their own? Is it uh, from the blogosphere? What, where does that pressure and all, abuse all, come all from? All from Mrs. Braley. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all of the above. All of the above. And I think, you know, I think the fear is as these pollsters get closer to election day, is that publishing an outlier will make them look silly when the ultimate election comes, because that's what they're going to be judged on. They're not going to be judged on a poll that they did six months earlier, or a year earlier, or 18 months earlier. They're going to be judged on how close their final poll was to the, final, to the so actual outcome. And so pollsters are afraid to be wildly outside the pack, even if their numbers tell them that, that in fact, the outcome is going to be outside what the average is, what the polling average is. OK, the morning after, when she was proved right and everybody else was proved wrong, she, was there deathly silence or was there she got, a lot, of she got a lot of praise? In, in, I mean, she got she, rightly a lot of people were saying, "Wow, you know, Ann Seltzer was right," and she was lifted up and given a lot of, of, of credit for having defied the conventional wisdom. Let, let's shift gears slightly and look at this from not so much from the journalistic perspective, but from the perspective of, of American politics. These things are being you know, not just done for and for journalists and for journalism. They're being done for the, you know, the campaigns are paying a lot of attention to it. Your clients, I assume, Kristen, are mostly aspiring office holders, correct? Uh, folks, they're very interested in understanding what the political fight is. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so what is this doing to politics? What is this, is this basically making uh, politics pure pandering? Is it something that, uh, that is going to sort of make the political climate worse, uh, or is it something that might sort of tip us over into the Mark Helpern's uh, idea last night that this is something that really could change very quickly for the better? What do you think? So I think it can go one of two ways. So the other way that data is playing a huge role in politics now is it's letting us uh, identify particular voters and figure out what we think their political leanings are based on thousands of different variables about their lives, ranging from their age and their gender to whether they have a knitting habit and have a dog. Uh, now, the vast majority of those variables don't actually matter, uh, but you, know, you can now figure out what voters really care about in a very specific way. What concerns me is that instead of 
pandering will see campaigns with really fragmented messages where they're trying to reach a million different voters with a million different very specific messages and it winds up kind of being a campaign about nothing where the, the overall message is just playing incredibly safe uh, and they're trying to figure out how to piece together that 50% 50.1% of voters in order to win instead of trying to aim for a broad coalition. Mark, what do you, how do you think this is going to shape the political, I mean, you painted, I know you were reaching for optimism last night, um, and you expressed optimism last night, but mostly it was in the form of hope, uh, but without much realistic sense that uh, much is going to change. How do you see the, the data element uh, playing into the political system that we have and the, and the partisanship we have right now? Well, the, the president's re-election campaign was a watershed in um, excellence for a campaign, uh, in part because they had very smart people and built on what they'd done in 2008, but in part because they took a, a quantitative difference and made a qualitative difference in terms of not just what they spent the money on to integrate polling, different kinds of data, uh, and on the polling side with market research, et cetera, but, um, but the, the volume of it. Uh, and they laughed at the Republican poll and they laughed at the media polling because it was so small in scale compared to what they were doing and, and sophistication that they knew it wasn't even close to the sophisticated instrument they had to measure voter sentiment, uh, not just in the horse race, but voter sentiment in terms of w w where the president stood with different voters in the targeted states. A lot of what's wrong you know, on the media side now and, uh, and in, in some of the non-political polling is the sample sizes are too small. And, and organizations aren't doing the sophisticated questioning about methodology that any, any serious pollster, whether it's a political pollster or media pollster, has to do now. I don't think anyone in 2016, despite the norm of improvement every four years, is going to reach what the president's re-election campaign did for a variety of reasons, uh, in part because they're all starting so late, uh, and in part because I don't think they'll be able to assemble the kind of team the president did for a re-election. At the same time, I think serious news organizations are examining their methodology. And the biggest problem is money, because you cannot do this on the cheap. And you look at the national exit poll, which I, I think has become a really flawed instrument because it is underfunded. And I worry that that data is used by everybody as gospel. John Kasich got a quarter of the black vote in Ohio, maybe. But that's based on an exit poll, which again, is not funded the way it used to be. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's uh, incumbent upon news organizations and political operations, whether they're campaigns or interest groups or private polling firms, to figure out how to build something close to as sophisticated as what the president did. Jill, how do you respond to that? I mean, Well, what? I think, think um, Mark said the money word, which is money. Um, and something that I worry about more broadly when it comes to data journalism, which is very much kind of the it thing right now, where you know many news organizations are raised, racing to set up you know, a data journalism group, is that they are mainly doing it on the cheap. And where it becomes much cheaper is comparing having a bank of political reporters, quote unquote, sitting at long tables behind computer screens, cheap, as opposed to actually sending reporters out in the country to, oh my God, talk to actual voters. Uh, the latter is shrinking because it's expensive to do that. And basically, if you go around and you see how most politi young political reporters are working today, They've got their tweet deck up. They're you know, maybe working with their data journalism colleagues. But one place they aren't is where David Rogers, when we both worked in, you know, I don't want to sound like an old fogey, but David and I worked in you know, the Washington Bureau of the Wall Street Journal under Al Hunt. And when campaign season got into high gear, we all left Washington. We went out in the country to do actual reporting and talking to actual people. And that, I think, because it's expensive, many news organizations are 
kind of throwing that out the window while they set up their quote unquote data journalism groups. David, how do you respond to that and look at that from the political perspective? Um, the, the, the amount of resources spent doing that, and, and frankly also, given your knowledge of the personalities and the character of Congress, how does, how do the, how does Congress, how do the members of Congress view this kind of climate of, uh, of, of data, but with unclear, I don't know, uh, with, with some lack of clarity about how to interpret it and what it means and how accurate it is? Congress is sort of an odd situation because of the district, because of the districting and how, you know, they, so you know they worry more about their primaries than their general elections in most cases. But I do think, I guess my general reaction to some of this is, as long as I've been covering politics, people worry we're too much about the horse race and so forth. And I think we ought to get over it. It you know that it's sort of it is a horse race, and we should just deal with it. But then when we get into all this data, like we're going to predict the horse race, we sort of miss the point of going out and talking to people. And I, I do think, going back to something earlier, I do think that when journalism thinks about, you know, I think that the, the trick will be people who start to go to state capitals and build a network from the state capitals up. And that I think that one of the best things to do would be to build a, a system where you, you were having people on the ground in the state capitals, and from that you built up to a better understanding of the country. And I do think that that's possible. Yeah. Well, John and Mark, you uh, you make a comment that Mark, you said that the, the you don't think that what the Obama campaign did in 2012 in, ter in terms of this kind of polling um, is going to be matched. Do you mean that the it's been completely dismantled? That the uh, the Clinton campaign or the Democratic campaign and the Republican Party's campaign are not going to be organized in the same kind of way at all? Uh, is it the, a matter of leadership, resources, uh, you know, triage, what? All of those things. <laughs> um, I think that just the president has had the benefit of being an incumbent. Uh, he had the benefit of a returning team supplemented by new people with new creativity and a real understanding of um, uh, a discipline to spend, not just on television advertising, but on building research. Building the re research costs a lot of money by the scale of everything by television advertising, but they recognize the, the value of it for peace of mind about where the race is, but also, again, about how to, how to reach voters. I just, I look at the political operations of uh, Secretary Clinton and of all the Republicans who are thinking about running, and I can just tell you, even if they started today, and they're behind in everything, yeah. they're behind in fundraising, they're behind in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, they're behind in congressional relations, they're behind in, in most cases, national identity. I mean, they're behind in so much. So the bandwidth to, to do this, even if they started today, I just don't think as a, as, a, as, a, as a temporal matter that they could build what the president built in time. The president had was an incumbent with four years, mm -hmm. a billion dollars, and no challenger. And a, and then, and a culture. And, 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 a, and, a, and a culture, and a, and a team, a returning team. So there's no one, there's no one like that. With the, the, who has both the time, the time, the money, and the and the in the and the, the infrastructure, both human capital and literally, and, and, and technological infrastructure. There's nobody like that in this cycle. And if somebody, if you had given any, if you gave Hillary Clinton, if she knew she was running two years ago, and you know, and she, you know, had a billion dollars to start with, you know, she, I mean, it's not it's not that, that that it could not be replicated. It's just that it will not be replicated because of the because of the, the nature of, of the advantages that Obama had. One of the things I consistently hear from folks on the right side of the aisle is that the problem for Republicans in 2012 was that you know, the research was bad. But moving forward from there, the ability to acquire the data is, is not very hard. The ability to get good computers and hire a bunch of smart people, that's all doable. The bigger problem is the culture change and the allowing data to drive decisions. Uh, and that's something where I, I, there, I still feel that Democrats are a little ahead of Republicans when it comes to using data to make smart choices about which voters you're gonna to talk to and how you're gonna structure your campaign and how you're gonna build your field operation. Uh, I think Republicans and Democrats can, can reach parity. I think actually the RNC in 2014 <coughs> did a pretty good job compared to the Democrats of building these models and collecting this data. They've really made huge advances. Um, but the bigger challenge now isn't the tech, it's the culture change within the 
these campaign operations. So what does this mean for the 2016 campaign? What is the implication? I think the implication is that it's, it's quite possible that, that Mark's right, that neither campaign will be able to match what the Obama team did. Mm -hmm. But it's also the case that you don't want to be the campaign in 2016 that's trying to do what everybody was doing four years ago. You want to be coming up with the next thing. Uh, and I, I think that the next thing for a smart campaign to do would be, uh, you know, right now we view you know, digital and data as kind of separate departments. Uh, they, are, they are separate from the communications team. They are separate from the finance team. I think smart campaigns will really make sure that they're integrated, that instead of having a separate digital department, you're recognizing the digital is integrated throughout the campaign. Um, there was a big article, I believe, in Politico, uh, where they were interviewing a number of different Republican digital and data strategists about would they want to go work for somebody in 2016. And the response was, we'd like to, but we need to have a seat at the senior staff table, because that's always been a problem on the right, that the senior staff is the ad makers, the fundraisers, the general consultants, and the data and digital guys, they're, they're kind of second or third tier. That's the culture change that I'm talking about, where a campaign that's really going to win in 2016 or 2020 will make sure they have those data-driven voices at the table when these big decisions are getting made. John, is that square with your, your sense? Yeah, I think what I think Mark is 100% right, and for anybody who's interested in, in, looking, at, in looking at this, it was actually at this, in, at this place, at the, at the Kennedy School, at the campaign manager's event in 2012, that the Obama campaign and the Romney campaign talked about, in some detail, about the different, the, how, what they were doing data-wise in the last two months of the campaign. And I think that almost everyone in the room their jaws dropped at the disparity. I mean, it was it, it was, was it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing how 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 little the Romney campaign was the doing. Lights went up. Relative, yeah. yes, the lights went up. That's correct. It's actually and, 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 but what the, the scale of the Obama operation, even for those of us who covered it closely, was jaw dropping, and how how the disparity was also jaw dropping. So I don't think, but but that actually raises two points. I think Mark is one hundred percent right that no one will rival or do on the scale of the Obama campaign did in twenty sixteen. But I also think the disparity will not be as great because Republicans were embarrassed by the disparity of 2012 and by the failure of Orca on, on election day. And the part of the reason why Republicans did a, are, are in my, a much better place as of 2014 is because of the scale of their embarrassment in 2012. They said, we must now be competitive in this area. So they invested very heavily in that. And I think the, the Democratic side and the Republican side going into 2016, whoever those nominees are, will be a much closer to parity than the, than the race was obviously in 2012, there was nothing like Harry. Well, when you look at the when you look at the way the race appears to be shaping up, Hillary Clinton is the odds-on favorite if she wants to run to get the nomination, whereas the Republican nomination is completely you know up for grabs. Does that give the Democrats in Hillary's campaign in particular an advantage, or are they even <laughs> trying to take advantage of the of the likelihood that she will not face serious uh, competition? Uh, well, I think their first the first presupposition there is that she's going to run. And I, I think at least, I know there are at least two people up here on this panel who are not 100% sure that she's going to actually run. Charlie Cook the other day said he thought there was a 30% chance that she wouldn't run. And, and I'm not quite that, uh, I'm not, I don't think 30% is right, but I think there's a maybe a 20% chance that she won't run. I don't know how to assign odds to that about, without using a lot of fake data. But I think there's a chance that she will, I think there is some chance, a non-trivial chance that she will decide not to run. And the longer she waits, and you know, Mark suggested something a second ago, which I think is true. She has nothing like a campaign infrastructure built now. She has a large, sprawling, fractious collection of advisors, some people she talks to who she really trusts, a whole bunch of people jockeying for position. But she doesn't have anything like an actual, even a shadow campaign right now. That's a functional unit that's actually really preparing in a way like they are sure she's running. And so every day that there is still uncertainty in her world, and every day that she does not actually make a decision to run is a day that they've squandered some of the advantage that she should have in, uh, in getting a, a leg up on whoever the Republican, uh, whatever the Republican field that ends up looking like. Let me open it up now to, uh, to a more general conversation. Uh, if you have a comment or a question, please just indicate by holding your hand up and we'll get you in. Yes, Bill. This is very scary because what you're I understand all this data bit. I make it up all the time. But the, but the issue to me is the fact that people actually make decisions based upon this data, which, and that is an example when originally Obama was, had an Iraq problem. He therefore said, I'm going to be strong and draw the line in Afghanistan. And all the data said that he was perceived as being weak on on, on military issues, 
And then look what that got us into. And I'm just wondering if there's a way of looking and saying how much our candidates, last night you said you hoped the candidate would be honest and forthright and put themselves out. What I worry about is they're listening to all this data and they're becoming sort of products of the of this data. Yeah, pandering. I mean, that's the, that's the only real word for it. Mark, what do you think? Well, I think there is a, a secret history of the president's time in national life uh, in which his advisors have had more data than any presidential campaign and any president has ever had. I don't get the sense that the president, though, is particularly driven by that. I think he factors it in, sometimes through the filter of the advice he's given, but I don't think he's, I mean, you could point to many decisions he's made where if you were simply following what the pollsters told no, him I'm to do, I'm talking about when they're running for office and the promises and the, and the positions that they take. And I wonder if anybody has done an, any analysis, post-analysis, of saying how much the movement that the candidate had to pander led to decision-making once they were in office. Kristen, I mean, why don't you address that? I mean, and effectively, for your clients, you have data. Uh, and you say, you're able to say, this is what these people who are prospective voters care about. Uh, does that mean that the candidate is expected to shift or necessarily make a decision based on that information? Obviously, gathering that information means that it's worth something to them. They're paying for it. Well, you certainly want to know where there are areas of agreement and disagreement between you as a candidate, you as an issue advocacy group, uh, and the, the voters of the audience that you're looking to reach. However, if you're using polling to decide what you believe, you're doing it wrong. Uh, what polling should be doing is showing you where the areas of weakness are, where the areas of strengths are, so that you can uh, make sure that you're focusing on your strengths. But polling should not be polling should not be the license to flip flop. So we talked about flip flops last night uh, and how people should be encouraged to flip flop if they get new information that encourages them to want to change their view. I don't think a polling result should be that 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 trigger for a flip flop. Um, and I actually think that what you're seeing nowadays is a real hunger for authenticity in politics. So much of Mark's advice to candidates about, you know, st stick up for what you believe, even if it's unpopular. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to put your personality out there. Uh, you know, be yourself, be authentic. I think is is really really important. I think voters nowadays there's so little trust in political advertising. There's so little trust in what politicians have to say that anyone who actually sounds like they believe what they are saying, uh, that that gets you a lot of credibility. And I think voters are willing to uh, listen to somebody with whom they disagree, but they believe that person really believes what they're saying. Um, and, and I'd be interested to see if any of these candidates in 2016 do try that kind of approach where, you know, let's say you're in a Republican primary, you hold a position that the polls indicate might be dangerous to you with a Republican primary electorate. Um, how you handle that, whether you whether you stick to that position and have a good defense for it, or whether you run from it or are guided by the polls, uh, I'll be interested to see how candidates uh, sort of well, deal with is, is, is polling and data gathering being used to determine what is the issue or package of issues that a prospective voter will make a decision on, no matter how he or she feels about every other aspect of a campaign's or a candidate's position. For instance, I'm reminded of how uh, Al Gore, in my view anyway, lost the election, presidential election because of uh, his embrace of gun control, which was something that, that uh, was very unpopular in the state of Tennessee and very unpopular in the state of Arkansas. And if he'd won either one of those states, he would have been president of the United States. I guess my point is, is that knowledge that if you support gun control, no matter how the economic interest or other interests may conform to what a candidate, uh, you know, theoretically would appeal to you for, that is the killer. That is the killer issue. That's something that has been a tradition in American politics since prohibition. That's how prohibition got passed. Uh, and I worry about that because, I mean, it's like what Bill was saying in a way, if you are mindful that people will decide these things on maybe one or two issues, no matter what else you think about it, where does that put the candidate in terms of making that, that calculation of what to give away and what to keep in order to, uh, to actually simply get elected? Well, I, I think that's a decision.
decision that each candidate would have to make for themselves, and I would hope that they would stick to what they believe in, sort of hell or high water. Um, but what, one of the things you can then change is what, what priority a certain issue is in the race. So I may disagree with a candidate on three or four issues, but if those are not particularly important issues, understanding that dynamic and trying to really put the focus on the areas where we do agree is sort of strategically what I think a smart candidate would do in that situation. Mark, John, do you all look at the, the, can, the, the, the population of the United States, the voting population of the United States, as basically fitting that profile I just described, having one or two issues that trump all others? I, I don't. Um, I, I think there's a, um, there are certainly, it's a complicated question, I think there are certainly voters who are single issue voters. That's a subset of the American electorate, or voters who have one or two issues that move them more than almost anything else. I think by and large, a much larger segment of the American electorate is moved by some complex of issues that uh, comport, that, that express their values and, and express their concerns on a daily basis. I think most people are mostly motivated by things like um, but what people think of as primarily pocketbook issues, although I don't, I don't mean that in the, the narrowest sense. I mean education, healthcare, jobs, um, wages, stuff that basically is you know how it affects them, affects them and their families on a, on a basic level, and how that overlays with what their values are. And, and I, mean, I mean values broadly defined, not ideology narrowly, because I don't think very many people, I don't think the majority of people actually have any firm ideology. But they do have values, or they value things like fairness or opportunity or community or whatever. And those that overlay of values on top of um, issues that directly affect them and their families, I think, is what motivates most people, as opposed to one or two single issue, uh, single issues that fall into a readily identifiable ideological category. Bernard. Well, <laughs> thank you, Alex. But uh, I would like to, to go back maybe to the structure of journalistic, if it is possible, uh, because I don't want, as a Frenchman, to say anything uh, about U.S. politics. I wouldn't dare to do that. <laughs> We have a messy enough situation at home uh, to talk about. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, we are in a much less optimistic mood this morning than we, we were yesterday evening. Maybe we didn't sleep too well, I don't know. <laughs> but I would like to go back to this uh, uh, optimistic side. Uh, could we argue that uh, the single biggest success of uh, digital media is in fact to force the traditional media to be better, better quality-oriented media. Now we are inundated by news. They are coming every second uh, on your smartphone from every, everywhere, etc. So we don't need newspapers to get the, the news. Uh, and it seems that there is a, um, a strata of news, media, and journalists. And where is journalists? Journalists, we need a journalist to explain the news, to put the news in perspective, to help the people understand. Because we have the news, but we don't have the meaning of the news. And the people are starving to find this meaning and to be citizens, understanding and making their proper choice. They could not do that. And since we need those journalists back home, then it seems to me that uh, the digital media are endangering bad journalists a tabloid journalist, but are helping the traditional media, which I call journalists properly, to get better. Well, let me, that let, an optimistic Okay, group? well, let me, let me ask uh, Jill and, and David to respond to that. Well, you know, I, I don't um, believe in a construct where there's di digital journalism and then other journalism. I think unquestionably journalism is transitioning into a digital world and that many news organizations are 100% digital. I think the challenge is that the, the media landscape that faces us now has a certain number of very high quality <coughs> news organizations, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Financial Times, some others that I'm leaving out, and that those news organizations have found a somewhat successful, I'm optimistic about it, business model where they've managed to replicate what was a stable double stream revenue source to support news gathering, i.e. 
advertising and circulation, they've managed digitally to be able to begin charging um, subscription revenue. But the number of news organizations that are able to succeed at that are going to be small because your news has to be genuinely of such a high quality that people are going to pay for it given the kind of inundation of information that you just described. And I think that's the challenge. The challenge is there are you know, a, group, a small group of quality survivors, but what's being wiped out is sort of regional and local coverage uh, and newspapers that cater to those audiences are kind of being wiped out of the um, news landscape. Yeah, but you don't, you don't you think that the trend is going a little bit like the Christian Science Monitor? So to uh, forget about the, the newspaper on the weekly day, to have a big magazine, uh, the people at the time, and try to understand what uh, they have got during the week. And so we are moving from a newspaper to a to magazine. The magazine is becoming a, a monthly. The monthly is becoming a book, etc. Uh, don't you see this trend? Well, the, there is. There's no question that that there is some of that. But let, David Rogers, let me ask you. Uh, one of the the essential point I think uh, that Bernard is making is that journalists are needed to explain and give context. And this is one of the things that, you know, when you read your articles, there's usually a statement of fact. And then there's a paragraph or two that explains in context who the people are who made this decision, why they did it, what the pressures were on them from various places. In other words, you take pains in a lot of your reporting, it seems to me, to, to embed context into the article, but it's context based on what your own personal analysis is of the situation. That's, it seems to me, a hybrid of what used to be a kind of, you know, just the facts, ma'am, kind of reporting. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the, I think when, when people talk about digital stuff, they talk about all the apps and the fast stuff, and, you know, but the reality is, we really talk about several things at once here because the reality is it's it's cheaper to present news digitally now. You know, you don't have to print the paper, you don't have to have the trucks and all that kind of stuff. That's part of what's happening. So there's no real reason why digital newspapers can't be as thoughtful as regular newspapers. So that's that I don't buy that. Um, I think that inherently, um, I don't know. I, I don't. It's not like I'm the only one who does this. I mean, I think part, Ken Hartner taught me a long time ago, part of journalism is getting the people to read you. Part of it's entertainment. And you do want to be able to explain to people. You want to give people a context. And I think that's just basic journalism. I don't think it's, you know, I think it's political. I probably have more freedom to do that than I did under the journal. And um, I think that probably there's, with the advent of so many outlets, there's probably a little more freedom, you know, that you have to guard yourself on it too. You have to be strict with yourself that you're not going too far in sort of your explanation of something that you're, you know, you're worried about opinion. But I do think, um, you know, that's all possible. I think that, but that, I mean, part of this discussion earlier with the, you know, if, if, if the next candidates don't have all the data, you know, the, Obama had, and I totally understand what Mark and Derek John are saying. I'm not sure that's necessarily bad, you know, that it might be better than, than the, you know, that maybe then they'll have to go out and figure it out themselves and not have David Pluff tell them something. But the point is, um, uh, I do, I don't really see the point about digital. I think we're trying to communicate to people what's happening in the world, and, and you know, and there are young people will, you know, people will have all these access to bits of news with their app, with their devices, but the reality is there's still the market for the larger thing. And in fact, I can, I suppose I'm partially I sometimes worry Politico is becoming almost too much a magazine at times than a newspaper, because we have found increasingly, you know, it can become an outlet for people who want to write about something. You know, I mean, it's almost like people are coming forward 
who want to write. I mean, one example is there was, um, you know, there was the terrible traffic jam in Atlanta, the snowstorm, okay? Well, out of the blue, this woman who works in Atlanta, who had a planning background, wrote this very intelligent explanation of why it was that way, because the, you know what I mean? And she wasn't a Politico reporter. You know, she came forward and wanted to be, and I think that is an exciting side of, you know, the mm -hmm. internet journalism. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, people come forward and want to write. Yes, Tom. So I wanted to ask you about <clears throat> what do you think about the kind of the intersection of journalistic bias and uh, statistical distributions of big data? Um, so if we think about Republican office holders, right? There are statistical distributions, right? So, and there's a mean, there's a vote. Um, and when we talk about authenticity, usually we're talking about Mavericks or outliers. We're talking about people who are outside the mean and the mode, right? So if you are a traditional Republican, and you talk that way, and you act that way, somehow you're not quite authentic, right? So that if, if you're off the mean, then you're authentic. That to me is a journalistic bias. So then I think about big data uh, and what I predict would be the uses of it. Uh, I think we're going to get more top 10 lists that will you know, get deep analysis out of big data. That's the easy interest. It's an easy thing to do. Uh, here are the top five housing markets or top 10 housing markets. Um, that data quite easily for that kind of analysis to really dig into, for example, the auto safety data. Uh, that's an enormous amount of work, requires extraordinary statistical capacity, uh, and probably doesn't have the audience interest. In I don't agree. You said the, the authentic Republican is the outlier? No, no, I said there's a little bit of a tendency in journalism to see the outlier as being more authentic. Well, well, I certainly don't agree that her, you know, Tom Cole from Oklahoma is by any stretch of the imagination a court of mainstream Republican. I mean, he's someone that the press goes to a great deal. Um, I think, and I think generationally, one of the big things in this next Congress will be you have a set of people on the Republican side, and this is a human thing, this has nothing to do with, you know, ideology who are coming to the end of the road, okay? I mean, how long can Lamar Alexander give, an obitu give a, a eulogy for Howard Baker and not do something when he's gonna be 80 by the time his term ends? How long can Murkowski, who may not run again for the Senate, you know, she's now got an opportunity to do something before she ends, you know, Susan Collins. I mean, these people, I don't agree. I, I, I mean, you know, we can, say data will lead to lists of tens. I mean, God knows we can do things the worst possible, and we, we often do. But the reality is that, uh, in terms of government, that there are people who are, um, there's no reason that we have to be so overwhelmed with this data to ignore the human side of the fact that these are people who are in government for some reason, and they're, they're running out of time. Well, what do you, for instance, expect Lamar Alexander to do with the time he has? Well, I, if you know Lamar Alexander, you know not to answer to exactly what to it's, it's like Matthias. Matthias used to be like this, and I cover Matthias, and it was like every year Matthias would do something. Do you know what I mean? And he and Mary McCord would write a great column about him, and Matthew stood up and so forth. And I used to, you know, come breathlessly across and say, "What, Senator? Senator?" Said, no, no, no. He, like he'd done it for that year. Okay, so <laughs> Lamar Alexander can be a little that way. But Lamar Alexander is on appropriations. Lamar Alexander has a, a significant role in the Education and Labor Committee. And Lamar Alexander has been in leadership. He's been a governor. He has a capacity to do a tremendous amount. And Tom Cole, you know, I mean, Tom Cole, I mean, he, Tom Cole is someone who has a leadership role. He's been in a lot of politics. He, he, someone that Boehner will listen to. He has a potential role there. I mean, all these people break your heart at different times. I mean, Tom Cole, I never understood this. When the, when the children came over the border and they put some of them in Fort Sill, Tom Cole was bent out of shape. Like, you would have thought he would, you know, the Fort Sill is like 19 square miles, you know, and there were like 100 kids there, and there were, what the hell, you know, it was not an issue, but he made a big issue of it. So I don't want to 
claim is going to be perfect, but I do think you can't lose sight of the fact that these are human beings in a, who have chosen to be in this role, and you have to keep <coughs> you have to keep that in mind in terms of what they do. I think that Lamar Alexander has you know he, he has a, he has potentially a very significant role in this caucus, and, uh, and um, you know there's a there's a set of people that you go through the list. I'm not talking ideology, I'm just talking just think how old they are, what they've got ahead of them, that I think they have to come to grips with what they can do. Let me ask this side of the table. What do you, how do you respond to that? So I think that the, the sort of rise of social media is changing the way people expect their leaders to interact with them. So they expect it to be much more personal. They, it's, it's really interesting to watch how different politicians use social media in, in different ways and how some of them kind of get how social media works and others view it as just another tech tool to broadcast the same sort of message. So the, the perfect example is, and I feel like this is turning into a bit of a Romney beat up on <laughs> kind of session, but in 2012, if you looked at Mitt Romney's Facebook page, you know, going right up to election day, it was all, here's how you can donate money, here's, you know, a picture from a rally, here's, you know, campaign, campaign, campaign. And as soon as the campaign was over, it suddenly became pictures of Mitt Romney and his grandkids. Even just this last weekend, the, the news was, you know, there, I, I saw the picture going around, it's Mitt Romney with his hair all messed up, because he's uh, Thanksgiving dinner with his grandkids. You know, there was the, the Mitt documentary that came out, sort of showed this other side of him as a person. And nowadays, we expect, and it's not just of our politicians, it's our celebrities, it's, it's our journalists, how they're branding themselves. You know, you put your personality out there, you, you create a brand, uh, and, and you support it through your actions on social media. I think people are now expecting much more of a personal understanding of the people that they're going to vote for, and they therefore expect social media to be used in kind of the same way that they keep track of what their friends and family are doing on social media. Well, you know, John and Mark, you're basically in the process of building a brand. Do you feel that you need to share every aspect of your life with the public? <laughs> uh, that would be trouble if it were me. <laughs> arrested more often than I frequently am. Um, I'll tell you what has been a learning experience. I don't know if it's as much a learning experience for Mark as it has been for me, but as we've set up and been uh, launching Bloomberg Politics, having one's eyes opened to the role that social media now plays in driving traffic to news and analysis and other things that are on our site. I mean, it is the, the, the behavioral patterns that are changing in terms of how people find news and the role that social media, more Facebook than Twitter, but Twitter to some extent, um, is really pretty staggering. And it's, it's clear that the old model of people going and checking the homepage of Politico or the New York Times or Bloomberg Politics is not the way people now are interacting mainly with news. They don't go to the homepage and try to see what's up there. They, some do, some do. But many, many more find their way to stories by, because they're friends on Facebook, as I said, and on Twitter and other social media, they, they find it in their stream somehow. And that's how they come to the site. And that is a huge deal for how all news organizations and all uh, media operations uh, think about how they go about disseminating the work of their reporters and analysts and feature writers or whatever. So Mark, did you send post selfies on Facebook from your trip to Italy recently? No. 
<laughs> you know, I think that there's a lot of challenges to it. The, the biggest one is trying to imbue social media content with the values that you have as a journalist in longer forms. Um, you know, I, I share Professor Patterson's concern about lists, uh, taking data and doing a quick thing with it. I think you need to marry up sort of additional concerns. You marry up that data to good writers and people who know how to make a compelling video. And that same challenge exists in social media. Um, the, the lure of it as a commercial enterprise and as an immediate way to reach viewers and readers and listeners is, is, is pretty hard to resist. But as I said, I, uh, my thinking about it for myself and for Bloomberg politics, a lot of that revolves around how do you, in 140 characters, do something that represents the brand you want to have of quality and integrity and um, consistency with everything else you're doing. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more. Yeah, Andy. So Jill talked uh, honestly and carefully about uh, branding and uh, high quality journalism, but what the panel has mostly in common is a one too many model. One expert whether it's an expert in polling or an expert in whatever, to the multitude. And what we're seeing, as John rightly pointed out, is a many-to-many -many model, which is based on the smartphone, on the ubiquity of the internet, on the ease of getting online, and on people's reluctance to believe in what experts tell them, which is in some ways scary because what we have in this room is an elite group that believes, rightly or wrongly, probably rightly, that what we're saying is true. And we talk sometimes about the wisdom of crowds, but what about the stupidity of crowds <laughs> when people vote against their own interests and do things that are <coughs> clearly harmful to the long-term uh, ubiquity of the uh, quality of the country. Well, so I would like to just hear more about how this paradigm is changing, what it means to politics and what it means to journalism. Well, I want to give uh, Mark and John the last word this morning. How would you respond to what Andy has said? The stupidity of crowds, or is that the... Uh... I guess I'd say that... Um, You know, crowds are stupid sometimes, and crowds are smart sometimes. You know, it's not there's not one right answer to that. I, and I think this actually goes back to something that Bernard was saying before. It seems to me, just as a, at a macro level, that you know one of the concerns about the fact that there is a and Jill and Jill talked about the the few the small few what have been the elite um, traditional media operations that are trusted that do a lot of trusted news coverage. It's clear that we're moving into a world in which there is, is it, as you say, a many a many model. Many people, citizen journalists, uh, citizen commentators, social media, all that stuff, where the, the, the internet is going to be produce a lot more voices and a lot uh, more, uh, a lot bigger, more chaotic world uh, of news commentary, news production, news uh, news analysis, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there are many people who look at that and think that the biggest fear is that the stupidity of crowds, or to put it another way, that the, an ocean of crap. Uh, flood and, and wash over what's left of quality. My, my optimism, to go back to our theme from last night, is that the great thing about, um, the, about getting rid of distribution monopolies and having a big wide open world and having a more diverse and chaotic world is that uh, there is no limitation on, on the content that can be there. Crap can coexist pretty well right alongside quality. <laughs> And it seems to me that as there is, and I'm, I, you know, it seems to me there is there is more and more crap. Um, there's also a greater need for a premium on uh, quality, which is to say trusted guides and interpreters and sources that people, in order to sort out the, the chaos and, and, and set, sort out the wheat from the chaff or the crap from the quality, the, the, the importance of people like David and and, and other experts. Um, I put quotes around that, but other people who know what they're talking about actually will rise in a world where crap and quality coexist.
people will be increasingly searching. Not their, they are inherently skeptical of some experts, but they're also recognizing their need to help people find, help them find where the quality is and to be uh, tr trusted uh, authorities and people who can place their imprimatur of, of their years of experience on certain information and help them make differentiations between what should be listened to, what should be trusted, and what should be discarded. Mm -hmm. Mark? Um, uh, first, since I know we're ending soon, I uh, want to thank Alex and, and the center for having us up here uh, again and, uh, and being such a great host. Um, second, um, John and I have to get back to New York uh, to do our show live at five. <laughs> so when this ends, uh, pardon us if we don't linger, because we've got to make our flight in this weather back. So um, it's already been delayed. So there you go. <laughs> so, uh, um, so so uh, so again, sorry if we have to rush out. Um, look, I think that it's easy to overstate how different things are now from the way they've always been. Uh, Pre-digital age, there was a fair amount of crappy stuff, and there were times when the crabs didn't behave in that intelligent way. I think that if you look at where we are now as compared to where we were 10 years ago when the leaders of most major news organizations were back on their heels trying to figure out how they were going to survive. Um, and, and, and leaders of, of places spent an inordinate amount of their time figuring out how to cut the staff and, and make up lost ad revenue as things went to digital. I think almost every major place that we care about as institutions in this country now are in a more, a more aggressive posture, uh, a more confident posture. And I think there are a lot of new places that are producing in the end, it's our responsibility to, as David has said a couple times correctly, make it entertaining, make it accessible, make it something that people want to consume. Uh, but it's going to be up to the citizens of the country to care about quality. We can't make young people care about quality product. We can try to make it entertaining, and we can work with civic leaders and educational institutions to try to foster an interest in the world around them. But in the end, it's going to be up to consumers and whether they, they want uh, to be an look at some of the countries we compete against, Japan is the one I know best, people read a lot more, more educated, more aware of the world around them uh, in many ways than people in the United States are, but it's a pretty vibrant country and, uh, and our leadership role in the internet allows us to take advantage of the possibilities of producing quality content that people are interested in. I'm optimistic because I do think that we have some really smart people some really great journalists. I, what, I, what I worry about within the realm of political journalism is, is the thing Jill said. Young reporters have to get out in the world and they have to know candidates and they have to know voters and they have to know uh, politicians who are never going to run for president but are still doing important things. And that's the, that is the foundation of quality winning out over um, all the crap that's out there. If we produce it and consumers want it, I think the digital age is great for that. John, Mark, David, congratulations. Jill, Kristen, thank you. Thank you all.